talking about it in first service, and I, I printed that song off late last night. I hadn't looked at our uh, order of service yet, and Dwayne sends it to me all the time. And I thought, wow, we're singing that song this morning that fits really, really neat. Go to 2 Samuel 22. This is David's song of victory. See, David, and all the things that he's gone through and all the different uh, high points and low points that we've been through together in our study, nothing is beyond his grace. Uh, we get to this point, again, we're really, really late in his life here. And uh, David's seen just about everything. And uh, <clears throat> I wonder if David was around now. Um, he'd probably go, eh, that's just stuff. That's just stuff. See, David's a warrior. And we're reminded that in his warrior makeup, uh, that there was this incredible heart underneath that warrior armor, and that heart was for the Lord. And, of course, he wrote some of the most beautiful words that you could ever read. Whether you liked reading the Bible or not, if you just took some of his words out of the context of whatever psalm it was, and just take, for instance, Psalm 23 and go, I wonder when he wrote that. And I believe, and there's different thoughts, I wonder if he just wrote it near the end of his life. I really do. I always wondered that. There's different people that say different times and different time stamps of when each one of these psalms was written. And see, 2 Samuel 22 is, has a partner, and it is Psalm 18. And Psalm 18 has a messianic flavor to it because the psalm itself references a lot about and to the prophecy of the coming Jesus. And David knows this. And you say, well, when we read that first verse, it tells us it's his last song he's singing this song he's writing this song unto the lord you say is this really at the end I, I do believe it is and that's psalm 18 again when you look at it you say some words are not the same very very close closely knit together there's some reasons that are thought of why there's some differences i heard that god authored the bible and he can kind of write it whatever way but there are some some thoughts as to why it is like it is and um, that's your homework for the week if you would uh, be willing to kind of dig into Psalm 18 and then of course 2 Samuel 22 and then send me an email with all the differences and explain them all and I'll grade your papers and we'll have a little ceremony next week and we'll see how you did and all of you who know you're going to be right make sure you turn it in all of those that don't think they're going to be right I will not embarrass you I promise Everybody thinks I'm really serious about that, don't they? No, I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. It'd be a great study. But I do have another study for you through our next few minutes. And at the end, uh, I hope you take it as some really neat homework. A song of victory. This song of victory that David is writing here uh, speaks of God's deliverance in his life. And we're going to take on 28 verses to start with. Next week, we'll take on the balance of the psalm because there's a lot here. But I want you to think about David and where he is at right now in his life. Again, near the end. Many heights and many depths that have been in David's life. And right now, and what he is uh, experienced with God, his grace and his mercy, his deliverance, his everything that he's done for him. He's also seen God's justice. He's seen the Lord execute wrath. We even look, of course, at last week's message, knowing that God's impending wrath, it's not far away. And you think, David wrote in this time of life one last song just to praise his Lord, to give praise to his Lord. And in these low points, filled with grief and weariness, I realize, and I've talked to different people over the years that are writers of poetry, writers of song, and they have shared that some of the best times for them to write something 
is when they're going through lowliness, loneliness, weariness, exhaustion, grief. David's been through so much, you can't blame him that he would be a little bit down. But as he's in his downtime, you see some of the most beautiful, sweetest words, some of the most inspirational words. I wrote in the notes that are online, low points filled with grief and weariness can inspire some of the sweetest words. David is exhausted. Do you blame him? Do you blame him for being exhausted? If you're exhausted today, I don't blame you. It can be exhausting. And for David's life, he realizes, I need to write a song of victory. I need to write a song of deliverance and praise. You say, that keeps on coming back. It's another one of the themes that comes back in our studies, that when things are getting really, really tough, or things are really rough, or things are really exhausting, call upon the name of the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. That's right here in this passage of Scripture. That's where it came from. But in light of that, let me, you can go back and look, or you can just see up on the screen, 2 Samuel 19. We were just here a little while ago. Absalom, his son, was murdered. And so David is forlorn. He's heavy-hearted. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son. In fact, also in 2 Samuel 18, which is the last verse of chapter 18, just before this, he says, the Bible says similarly, the king was much moved, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept, and he went. Thus he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. This man, David, is exhausted and weary, and he's going through an awful time in his life. He is a warrior, he is a king, he is a soldier, but he also has a heart for God, and his heart is broken also, too, because he has a heart for his children. This man was a weary, weary soldier, but he was a broken-hearted parent. Also, too, 2 Samuel 21, not far away, it says in verse number one, we looked at this last week, then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered it is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites, he broke that covenant, and there had to be a pavement, payment for that covenant that they broke. So again, David's going through quite a bit here. David's going through just a reminder that it's just been just a few months back that he lost his son. It's not that long ago that he's been experiencing this three-year famine, this drought in the land for the people as he's inquired of the Lord. And just one more thing, by the way. Look at verse number 15 of chapter number 21. Remember last week? It says up there, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. You think they've ever gone to war with the Philistines once, twice, three times, four times? You see, the Philistines would never let David alone. The Philistines, the Amalekites, God had commanded Saul to take them out. And there's still an enemy. Still an enemy. The Ammonites. Still enemies against the nation of Israel. But the one interesting thing about all the enemies that were ever against David, be reminded that even though Saul saw David as an enemy, David never, ever classified him as an enemy of his. He more so dealt with the Philistines, who went to war again with Israel. That will tire you out. When something that seemingly has been taken care of, some enemy seemingly keeps on coming back to war against you. David, it says at the end of verse number 15, and his servants with him, they went down and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. He's exhausted. He's tired. He's weary. It says that Ananijah, his nephew, took up the battle for him and said, hey, king, 
you stay out of the battle right now. We'll make victory for you and give you glory for it. Ultimately, the Lord gets the glory, but we don't want you to get killed in battle because if we lose you, king, we lose our light. We lose our presence, and we lose the type of Christ that you are, the God-man that is king. We don't want you to get killed in battle because you are waxing faint. You're tired. That's the status of David. And oh, by the way, now he's going to write a beautiful song. Okay? A beautiful, beautiful song. What about your life? Have you been through some battles in life? Are you going through some right now? Are the Philistines come, keep on coming back and bothering you? <laughs> they just never forget David. They keep on bothering him ever since he was a young man taking out their champion, Goliath. Is it possible that you're mourning or in grief over some loss that you've had to suffer through? Maybe it's the fact that, hey, I look at this message today, I'm thinking, I sure hope that God will show me something that will really, really lift me up. Well, I believe it will today. I believe you'll see how beautiful this scripture is and how this message on the other side of looking at God's impending wrath we see God's incredible glory in this second Samuel chapter number 22 join me here as we look at this outline we have the first few verses we're going to read each package of scripture according to our notes and according to our outline verse number one through three David spake unto the Lord the words of this song. In the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. You say, well, he delivered him out of Saul a long time ago. Yes. It's just a compilation, a, a, a completeness of what has happened in his life and a recognition. And don't forget real quick, that last chapter we looked at the fact that Saul, King Saul, had done wrong in breaking the covenant with the Gibeonites and he had to recompense that. He had to make that right, that wrath of God that had to be assuaged. So this is appropriate in the statement that David looks at his life and says, The Lord deliver me out of the hand of his enemies, out of the hand of Saul. And it says in verse 2 and 3, great verses. This is David's declaration. This is my declaration of the Lord in song. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. What does it say in verse number two? My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my rock in verse number three. In him I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me. From violence. It's very personal. Very personal. David's declaration of who God is in his life being this personal just really, really reminds you and me of personal relationship with the Lord and how you and I view him. He talks of David. I'll just take one of them as an example here just for our notes. Look, David declares that he's his fortress, and he delivers him, and all those things, but he calls him his rock. You ever stood on a rock? A rock that's not cracking, a rock that's not moving. In fact, a rock is immovable. In the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 10, where we find out that Jesus Christ is the rock. We find out that Jesus Christ speaks of himself as being the rock. As Peter says, you are the rock. In Matthew chapter number 16, chapter number 18, when you think about how Jesus Christ pulls us all together, and Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, whose name means stone, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As a false religion would speak of, that's all, of course, where Peter's being called the rock. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my church on you. No, he's referencing what Peter said about him. And upon this rock, the rock you're referencing, who is Christ, the son of the living God. This is Jesus. This does not mean that the church is built upon Peter. But it's built upon Christ as the rock. Now think about our guy by the name of Moses. 
Moses called his Lord his rock as well. Deuteronomy 32, that song that he wrote. That song of Moses, and you think, really? Same stuff? Yeah, David's referencing the same Lord in the same way, declaring, hey, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. How should one chase a thousand or two, put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? That's Moses speaking of holy God and his song of calling God his rock. Don't forget, just a quick note, free of charge. This is just like a little commercial. Here you go. Didn't you have to pay for any of this? Here you go. Moses did not go into the promised land, correct? It was God's judgment upon his life for striking the rock. Yes? The rock is the living God, pictured Jesus. He was told to what? Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. He got angry. And instead of speaking to the rock, Jesus... He struck him. Now, you might see that as a little bit of stretch, but I wonder, who in the world did Moses think he was? Who do I think I am? That when I don't get things the way I ought to be, that I would lash out at the rock, who David's saying is the one that he stands on. Your rock today And the one that you sing about is your fortress, your shield, your deliverer, the buckler, your foundation. He is your rock. It is possessive. He is my rock and my salvation. Also in his song, David brings out his distress. He's going through some tough times and he reminds us in his distress to pray. Nothing wrong with a little bit of prayer in your song that you're going to write unto the Lord. By the way, that's your homework for this week. What's your song? How are you going to write this song? Well, it should have some prayer. David's prayer in distress in verse number four. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. This is when it's in Psalm 18, messianic statements of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking of this. The ungodly men that are against Jesus, what are they going to do? Verse number 6 says, The sorrows of hell compass me about. The snares of death prevented me. What do you do then? Verse number 7. In my distress... I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Wow. Don't you like a quick remember, reminder of who's got the biggest ears in the universe? It is God and God alone. And David's distress is a reminder for you and me that there are ungodly men There are people of Belial. There are ungodly men that make you afraid. There are the sours of hell that come past you about. You say, hey, it gets so hot out there, it feels like hell. Okay, that's the the humidity. How about the temperature of the spirit of this world right now? That's a little introduction. That's just a little peek into being compassed by torment for all of eternity. David's speaking in his distress about all of his enemies over all the years. This man has known enemies. It had to be probably 10 years where he was f- fleeing from the enemy. The enemy that he never called enemy, but Saul is an enemy, the Philistines is enemies. There was constant people against David. And in his prayer, in his distress, he realizes these enemies have been about me. 
I've been the king, and I will end up being king for 40 years, from Hebron all the way here to Israel and back, when I fleed the kingdom because Absalom took it, and then I came back. David knows distress. David knows enemies. And as David is a type of Christ, and many of the Psalms are indirectly referring to Jesus Christ... These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Jesus says that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. And that's David writing messianic stuff that's also in Psalm 18. Knowing, of course, that he's in distress. And it ties directly together with Jesus Christ. David wrote in Psalm 4. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Psalm 145, verse 19. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. David's prayer in distress is heard. The Bible says in verse number 7. And he did hear my voice out of his temple and did cry. Excuse me. And my cry did enter into his ears. Go back to that verse number four. That's a nice little song. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be. What happened? My voice went crazy. Here we go. <laughs> so I shall be saved from my enemies. Thou art my Lord. I will call upon the Lord. And then these next bunch of verses. Watch this. God's manifestation of his own glory and victory. Do you know about God? Sure I do. Tell me. Can you come up with a list of things that God is? God is faithful. God is kind. God is omniscient. Go on and on. You can go through the whole list. Look at this cool list that David comes up with. This is the fun part about reading some of his stuff. And of course it comes in the Psalms. Verse number 8, watch this, just, just perk your interest, perk your attention to all those things that David says about the Lord. Verse number 8, then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. So God was angered. God's angered. Okay, that's cool. Or not so cool, depending on who his anger is against. Verse number 9. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth, devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Whoa. God has smoke coming out of his nose. And he has fire coming out of his mouth. Hmm. Verse number 10. He bowed the heavens, or bowed the heavens also, and came down. And darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. Ezekiel talks about this, the cherub. God. God can fly. Did you know that? He doesn't even have to be Superman. He can fly. He can fly on the wings, it says there, of a cherub. He rode upon a cherub. Verse 12. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Yeah, he made those. Why? Verse number 13. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. Wow. How would you know how bright light is unless you knew how dark darkness is? God makes the darkness. And then he says, let me show you my brightness. He says there in verse number 14. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. Well, I guess they must be bowling up in heaven when it thundered and lightning. This is God thundering. The Bible teaches me that his voice sounds like thunder. Job experienced that. You know, he spoke out of a whirlwind, the Bible says in Job. He spoke with a thundering voice. He spoke so loudly that it sounded like thunder. Check it out. It's in the Bible. God's voice thunders. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And by the way, he wouldn't have to shout or raise his voice like me. God could just go, 
and it's thunder, it's lightning. Verse number 16, the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were discovered. At the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his knowledge, rules the Bible says that God spoke, that God breathed, and everything happened. He didn't have to get out some construction manual. He didn't have to call in some engineers, get planning commission. Oh God, if he had to use the Blue Springs Planning Commission, he'd be there forever. God just built it. God made it, and on the foundation of this world, the foundation of this earth, it tells me the foundations of the world were discovered, the channels of the sea appeared. We know in Genesis chapter number 1, everything about how God put things in place. In verse 17, it said, He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of the many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy. This is God's manifestation of himself in giving victory. Look at the scripture. God is not only what you have limited him to in your mind. He's so much more than you think he is. So why don't you read a little bit more about what was written about him in a song like this and just capturing a few verses. We see in verse number 19, they prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. God manifested himself in David's life. God manifested himself in sound, in creation. He manifested himself in the quiet moments and in the loud moments. He showed himself powerful. It says in Hebrews 12, he will bow, excuse me, bow the heaven and the earth. Exodus 19, and be ready against the third day, for the third day of the Lord will come down in the sight of all people upon Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke. Do you remember when the Lord appeared on Mount Sinai? Think about who God is and the sounds, the sights. Clearly, he is God. In Ezekiel 9.3, it says the glory of the God of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10. So much of who God is is found in the scripture if you and I would just read it and see that he manifests himself in victory. Through the brightness before him were coals of the fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven. Whew. Psalm, excuse me, Job 37 says, God thundered marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. This is God. He thunders in his voice. In Psalm 29, we find the Lord's voice compared to many, many things. Just like in 2 Samuel 22. His voice is upon the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. Go jump in on Psalm 29. You see, the song of victory includes prayer and distress, declaration of who God is, and then a reminder of what God has done for you and me to bring us victory. This is not, well, you know, it sounds like it's possible maybe that God could possibly, maybe, I don't know if he could, but maybe he could come through maybe when I'm having, no, no, please, please, brothers and sisters in the Lord, and those of you who are lost and do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, He will manifest himself in victory in your life. If you would just, and I would just, humble myself and allow him to do so. Oh, and by the way, I heard he was coming again. And in his second coming, when he comes again, the thunder will be nothing. The thunder will be nothing compared to the noise and the glory and the shine, brightness of his glory upon that horse. And when we come back and you think about that, he will finally, one more time, just in case everybody missed it, manifest himself as God Almighty and glory to God. Now I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When will I write a song unto the Lord? So let's write a song unto the Lord this week. Because David's honor and God's faithfulness come out here in this last section that we're looking at this morning. Watch this, verses number 20 through 28. And I want you to think again about David and his life. How he has known sin. He would be the first to tell you. If he came back and came up and David, hey, King David, could you come up and give us a testimony of God's grace in your life despite your sin? He would stand up and he'd take five minutes and tell you, 
I am not worthy to receive the forgiveness that I have received. I am so sorry for sinning against my God and my God alone, just like each one of us. He wrote the most beautiful stuff about that. You can't, nothing better. And then he learned of this walk with the Lord, living a righteous life. Living a life fulfilled and fulfilling in doing what the Lord asked him to do. He knew this side too. And he writes about it in verses 20 through 28. Verse 20. He brought me forth also into a large place. Now watch this. David's honor of the Lord. David's obedience to the Lord. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. This has to be after he made right with God, doesn't it? A while back, because he didn't make right with God before. It's making right with God and living in that righteousness. And it says the Lord rewarded him. Why? Because of his righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. Verse 22, for I kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. This is not a works-based religious thinking process. It is a joy in the Lord to walk in his righteousness. It is a completeness and a perfection in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been saved, born again, you're in the new covenant. The Lord Jesus Christ is yours. And you belong to him and he belongs to you. God is for you. You have the Holy Spirit of God, the living God of the universe. When you get saved, and everything changes upside down. So you can live a righteous life. You will have sin, and sin will come, and will visit you according to your flesh, yes. But there's this beautiful righteousness of God that's in you and me. And David knew that. He says, I kept the ways of the Lord, and then I have wickedly departed from my... I'm not going to depart from God. You want to have a sweet life? No matter what the trials and tests, because they're coming anyway. I say it all the time. How about if you and I just keep the ways of the Lord? Verse 23, for all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. Boy, did somebody know about his, God's judgments? Boy, he did. Woo, he knew, because he faced them all. There wasn't a thing that didn't happen to this man. It wasn't heartbreaking in judgment of God. But then on the other side, he experienced grace like few in the Bible that you can read about. The grace of God handing him things and giving him gifts. This is what he's saying. God's grace gave this to him. God didn't have to. He says in verse 24, I was also upright before him and kept myself from mine iniquity. Mine iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. This is the man who had a heart after God. It's after this. It's right inside of here. It's in here. This is what we're talking about. With merciful, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. And with the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. Verse 28, and the afflicted people, thou wilt save. But mine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. Wow. David's life song. He knows how to do it right, and he knows how to do it wrong. <laughs> Every one of us can write that song, can't we? We know how to walk with the Lord. We know what it's like to walk with the Lord. We know what it's like to have this incredible relationship with the Lord. What is David telling us? That when I honor the Lord with Walking by faith, I experience his incredible faithfulness back in my life and his incredible grace upon my life and mercy. He will be merciful to those that live a merciful life. Wow. See, God's victory in your life and my life, God's way of showing us victory, God's manifestation of himself is, I believe, so much more than you and I. We've missed so much of that. We really have. So, will you write a song of victory this week? Maybe. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll write it out. Maybe you'll take these three things real quick into consideration. First one, watch this. 
our song of victory unto the Lord should be filled with praise. And deliverance from our sin and deliverance for our souls. The day that my life was changed, the day that your life was changed by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You are delivered from his wrath. You are delivered from the punishment of sin. You are delivered from torment and hell for all of eternity. You are delivered from paying the price yourself. You are delivered from the condemnation that comes when we realize that the condemnation came by us. You and I have been delivered. We are his, we are his children and he is our savior. It says in verse number 3 of 22 that he calls him his savior, my savior. It says in Psalm 18, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation. Declare it. Speak it. When you blow that horn, he is the horn of my salvation. He is the one that makes the noise. If you would allow him, they make the noise. So in the song of victory that we should sing unto the Lord, why don't you make a little bit of noise and say, thank you, Lord, for delivering me from hell. David knew that. You ought to start a little bit more and just go, wait a minute here. Do I have a song to sing? My victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all, all, all. I don't know. I think sometimes we don't sing a song of victory because we don't realize what well, we got saved unto as much as we got saved from. My Savior. Your Savior. He's your Savior. He's the horn of your salvation. He is your high tower. Why would not my words in my song of victory be filled with praise for his deliverance of my soul? When you write your song of victory or sing it, maybe you ought to take this one into consideration. The singing of our song of victory ought to echo David's praise words of God's glorious character. What do I mean? I said it earlier. Let me expand your thinking just a little bit. Because I believe our understanding of God's character is really, really tempered. Too small. Too tiny, unfortunately. God is self-existent. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is immutable, transcendent, eternal. He's filled with wisdom. He is sovereign. He is filled with faithfulness. He is full of love. He is infinitude. He is immensity. His goodness and godness. He is justice. He is mercy. He is grace. His eminence, his holiness, his perfection. And I just listed about 20. That's all I'm listed here today. Look at what God is. Look at who he is. Do you know who God is? Do you know what he is? Do you and I really know who he is? He's the one whose voice thunders. Boy, you're awful loud. I know I am. But my voice is nothing compared to his thunder. And all he would have to do is just go, Cora, I'm with you, girl. Listen. Listen. Smoke comes out of his nostrils. Did you know that? Fire comes out of his mouth. Did you know that? Do you know much about God at all? Sad to say, church, we need to stop being so limited by ourselves because God wants you to know and you ought to be echoing David's praise words because he wrote so many things that you and I have just blown off. Get into his songs and see that he has written things about God. Think about this. It says in verse number 18 and 19 of Psalm 18, they prevented me in the day of my calamity. 
those people that were against him, right? This is a repeat of chapter 22. Right? Watch this. But the Lord was my stay. As a beautiful illustration of that mom standing up and picking up her child. That daughter right there knows that her mother and her father are her stay. No matter what happens. Some crazy man screaming and yelling in a room. She knows. See, that's what you are. You're a picture of your son, for your sons of the Lord's stay. We're not going anywhere. It also says about the Lord that he brought me forth. When he brings you forth, that means he's got you. He's going to grab a hold of you. It says also, too, that he's going to deliver you, deliver me, because he delights in me. Those are just four things in two verses. Do you know that if you would just echo what David wrote in his praise words, you'd have a song of victory in your life that you would sing every single day? You may laugh sometimes at what Bobby says. I think they sometimes do. Just love Jesus. Just love Jesus. Because that's what this is. It's a little deeper meaning here now. You've got to figure out how to love. You've got to figure out how he loves you. It'll carry you through all the wickedest, awfulest times in your life. And your song of victory will resonate to this last piece. You'll be able to write something down. I'm looking forward to your compositions this week. The composition of your song and my song of victory unto the Lord, it'll happen when you have a life well lived in Jesus. Now just think for that for about a minute. You say, I don't have a song yet to compose. I'm too young, I'm too old, whatever it is. I didn't put a time or an age specific criteria on this. A life well lived in the Lord. You've gone through some trials. You've gone through some tests. You've gone through some victories. Some of the neatest things that I've ever read have been by people that are very young. And I appreciate that. Because you can write things down that are song of victory when you live your life well in Jesus Christ. When will that happen? When you live your life well in Jesus Christ. When will you compose things? It may be right on the tip of your tongue right now. Maybe you just need to get a handle on, I need to get a handle on echoing David's words. David's praise words, they're incredible. And you and I go, wow, this is really good stuff. You better believe this is. This is really good stuff. Not what I'm saying, but what God says. Don't listen to me. Listen to God's word. Hear what he's saying. This psalm of praise and victory was written and sung after the Lord did all that he did in David's life by grace, by goodness, by faithfulness, by covenant, by mercy. Look at all the mercy that God's shown you. Look at how the Lord is your stay. He will keep you, and you will not have to move. It says in Psalm 18, and I'll finish with this package of this pair of verses. Verses 27 and 28, Psalm 18, the mirror with a few changes out of 2 Samuel 22. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but wilt bring down high looks. Watch this. For thou wilt light my candle. Thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. The song of victory unto the Lord will happen when we have a life well lived in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how you can write words like this? Because you've spent time in the Lord. You spent time with God as he's taken you through the most wickedest, awfulest things that can happen in your life. And yet he still says, I will light your candle. I will be your God. I will enlighten you in your darkness. Because if you haven't faced darkness yet, you will someday. And when you face it, I pray that you will live life well. Because I will tell you that David knew after losing his son 
after having a famine on his people, after having to fight some more wars in his older age, he still knew the Lord was his strength. The Lord was his savior. The Lord was his buckler. The Lord was his deliverer. The Lord was his everything. Why don't we not write a song of victory? Because we don't know that the Lord is our everything. So maybe this week, God's people will see that they have a song in their heart. And the song comes just like it came from David's heart. It'll come from the heart that God gave David in the midst of his life that was so rough, but yet so filled with grace, so filled with goodness, so filled with mercy, so filled with light, even in the midst of darkness. Why hasn't your song of victory been composed? Our Father in heaven, our holy Lord God, we come to you in prayer in this moment as we close out our time in worship and the preaching of your word, being reminded that you are our victory. Thank you, holy Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being my Savior, for being our Savior, for being my strength, for being my high tower, for being my foundation, for being my shield and protector. Thank you for being personal for every single one of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us so much more than we deserve. Thank you for, Lord God, not giving us what we do deserve. Thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. I pray this week you will speak to your people in your church, in your body. And as you restore the body principle in the local church, you restore each one of us to the recognition that we have this incredible life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ought to be filled with a song of victory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being my victor, being my victory. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen, amen. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Our salvation.